on World News Tonight. Crisis talks. Major summits took center stage in handling of the conflict in Ukraine. Global leaders continue to discuss on what more can be done to stop Russia in its path of carnage. Migrant mania. Overwhelming numbers of displaced Ukrainians are now seeking refuge in neighboring countries. To lighten the load, America steps in, lending a helping hand to those left helpless. New nukes. North Korea's nuclear activity is causing distress for countries across the globe as they introduce a lethal new weapon capable of mass destruction. And scuttling critters. Swarms of red crabs make their annual journey to the sea in dramatic numbers as spring rains arrive. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with more updates on the raging war between Ukraine and Russia. World leaders came together for back-to-back -back meetings of the G7, NATO and the EU. U.S. President Biden, present at all three of them, decided to bolster humanitarian aid to Ukraine and extend sanctions against Russia. He also said that America would react if Russia used chemical weapons. Western leaders piled on military and humanitarian aid for Ukraine on Thursday, with U.S. President Joe Biden calling Russian leader Vladimir Putin a brute and Britain denouncing Moscow's invasion of its neighbor as barbarism. At an unprecedented triple summit in Brussels, NATO, G7 and European Union leaders addressed the continent's worst conflict since the 1990s Balkans Wars. Biden stressed the importance of the Western alliances. The single most important thing is for us to stay unified and the world continue to focus on what a brute this guy is and all the innocent people's lives are being lost and ruined. NATO announced new battle groups for four nations in East Europe, while Washington and London increased aid and expanded sanctions to new targets. Ahead of the summit Thursday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he was grateful for the support Ukraine had received from individual NATO member states, but that NATO had yet to show what the alliance can do to save people. And I have been repeating the same thing for a month now. To save people and our cities, Ukraine needs military assistance without any restrictions. The European Union was set to unveil steps to wean itself off Russian energy, likely to drive up fuel costs even further around the continent. But the measures stopped short of Zelensky's calls for a full boycott of Russian energy and a no-fly zone over Ukraine. The invasion unleashed by Russian leader Vladimir Putin has killed thousands of people, sent more than three million people abroad, destroyed cities, and driven more than half of Ukraine's children from their homes, according to the United Nations. Russia calls the invasion a special military operation. In the Ukrainian port of Mariupol, nearly flattened by the Russian bombardment, hundreds of thousands of people have been hiding in basements without running water, food, medicine or power. But Moscow has failed to capture any major city. Russian troops have taken heavy casualties and are low on supplies. Ukrainian officials say they are now shifting onto the offensive and have pushed back Russian forces, including north of Kiev. Moscow Thursday said the West had itself to blame for the war by arming the Kiev regime. Furthermore, NATO leaders agreed to bolster defenses, particularly in Eastern Europe, and will deploy four new combat units in Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria and Hungary. NATO leaders will also develop plans for additional forces and capabilities before their June summit. Faced with its most serious military threat in decades, NATO is stepping up defense efforts and bolstering its eastern front. Last year, the alliance deployed four so-called battleground groups in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland. These consist of multinational combat-ready forces comprising around a thousand troops each. NATO now wants to deploy four more in Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria in order to maintain a constant military presence from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The alliance also directly controls some 40,000 troops known as the NATO Response Force, or NRF. These land, air and maritime units, which can be sent to the front at short notice, began deploying in Romania last month. Last but not least, 
Around 100,000 U.S. soldiers are currently stationed in Europe, most of them in Germany, Poland, Italy and the U.K. All these troops are backed by hundreds of aircrafts and ships, as well as sophisticated air defense systems. President Joe Biden says the U.S. has an obligation to respond to the refugee crisis spurred by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Thereby, the United States will take up up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. The White House has announced as more than 3.5 million people have fled the country amidst Russia's continuing bombardment. The Biden administration announced on Thursday that the United States plans to accept up to 100,000 Ukrainians fleeing Russia's invasion while also pledging $1 billion in new humanitarian aid. This news comes after a month of bombardments touched off Europe's fastest moving refugee crisis since the end of World War II and coincides with U.S. President Joe Biden's meeting with European leaders in Brussels to coordinate the Western response to the crisis. This is not something that Poland or Romania or Germany should carry on their own. This is an international responsibility. The United States is a leader, one of the leaders in the international community, has an obligation to be engaged, to be engaged and do all we can to ease the suffering and pain of innocent women and children and men, for that matter, throughout, the, th throughout Ukraine and those who have made it across the border. So far, more than 3.5 million people have fled Ukraine since Russia invaded on February 24th putting a strain on the neighboring European countries receiving them. As a result, U.S. lawmakers and advocates have urged Biden to do more to help those seeking refuge in the United States. The Biden administration said in a statement it would use the full range of legal pathways to bring Ukrainians to the United States, including the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. The current effort to allow more Ukrainians into the United States is part of a broader series of aid measures announced by the Biden administration on Thursday, including $1 billion in new funding toward humanitarian assistance to support people still in Ukraine and those affected by the global impacts of Russia's war, which Russia calls a special military operation. The Biden administration will launch a new democracy and human rights program that aims to provide at least $320 million in new funding to defend human rights in Ukraine and neighboring countries. German utilities say the country needs an early warning system in case a sudden halt to Russia gas supplies leaves firms and consumers short of supply. European consumers still have gas to cook their food and heat their homes. But Germany's big utilities fear an energy crunch is coming. On Thursday, they said that the country needed an early warning system in case Russian gas supplies dry up. The comments came a day after Moscow said it would demand payment for gas in rubles from so-called unfriendly nations. That left gas buyers puzzled over the consequences and fearing a squeeze on supply. Germany's Utility Industry Association said there were concrete and serious indications supply was about to worsen. It says decisions need to be made on which industries get gas if there's a shortfall, while households are protected under existing rules. Ministers said there was no need for any special mechanism now, but the situation was being closely monitored. Countries around the world are trying to figure out what happens if Russia does demand rubles. South Korea said it would do whatever it takes to maintain imports. But a top Italian economic advisor said Rome would continue to pay in euros. Germany's Commerzbank said it should be possible to pay in rubles, but only if some of Russia's commercial banks are excluded from sanctions. Consumers for now just fear that any new disruption means even higher energy prices ahead. In the latest plane crash in China, rescuers are on the field still in search of survivors. So far, none have been found and Mother Nature does not seem to be coordinating either as rainfall disrupts the expedition. Rain hampered the search on Thursday for survivors of an Eastern Airlines jet that plummeted into a mountainside with 132 people on board, turning the crash site into a field of mud. No one has yet been found, and experts have said it's all but impossible that anyone could survive such an impact. The recovery team continued to search for a second cockpit voice recorder, as investigators began examining the first black box, found on Wednesday, whose recordings appear to have survived the impact of Monday's crash. 
It was too early to determine the cause. Debris from the Boeing 737-800, including engine blades, tail stabilizers and wing remnants, was concentrated within 30 meters of the main impact point, which was 20 meters deep. A fragment suspected to be from the plane was found about six miles away, prompting a significant expansion of the search area, officials told a news briefing. That added to the team's other difficulties. More than 1,600 people are involved in search operations. Flight Enmu 5735 was en route from the southwestern city of Kunming to Guangzhou on the coast, when it suddenly nosedived from cruising altitude at about the time when it should have started the descent to its destination. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. North Korea reported that it did fire an intercontinental ballistic missile and vowed to continue developing its military capabilities in preparation for what it called a long-term confrontation with the United States. North Korea conducted what was thought to be its largest intercontinental ballistic missile test ever on Thursday. That's according to the South Korean and Japanese militaries. It marks a dramatic end to a self-imposed moratorium on long-range testing and would be the first full-capability launch of the nuclear-armed state's largest missile since 2017. In response, South Korea said it had conducted a live-fire test of multiple ballistic and tactical missiles immediately after North Korea's alleged launch. Japan's Vice Defense Minister Makoto Aniki said the projectile appeared to be a new model of intercontinental ballistic missile, given that it reached an altitude of more than 3,700 miles. The actions carried out by North Korea are a threat to peace and security in our country, region and the international community. North Korea is provoking the international community by escalating its launches, even as the international community is responding to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we absolutely cannot tolerate this. The North's return to major weapons tests also poses a new national security headache for U.S. President Joe Biden as he responds to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The launch represents a major step in the North's development of weapons that might be able to deliver nuclear warheads anywhere in the United States. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki called the launch a brazen violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions, adding that it needlessly raises tensions. North Korea had put its ICBM and nuclear tests on hold since 2017, but has defended the weapons as necessary for self-defense. It has said the US's diplomatic approach is insincere as long as Washington and its allies maintain so-called hostile policies, such as sanctions and military drills. Thursday's launch would be at least the 11th North Korean missile test this year, an unprecedented frequency. Both South Korea's outgoing President Moon Jae-in, who made engaging North Korea a major goal of his administration, and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemned the launch. Japanese authorities said the missile flew for around 71 minutes, at a range of 684 miles from its launch site. Hundreds of student activists gathered in front of the Australian Prime Minister's Sydney residence as part of a global protest demanding climate action. Let's cross over to other than the world news special correspondent Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy. Yes, Anna. New South Wales police were called to the unauthorised protest to try to get the man down from the crane as climate change demonstrations continue for a fourth day. Students joined by union officials and members of First Nations communities descended on Scott Morrison's Curieville House with signs and chants to demand greater action on climate change, a hot topic following the recent catastrophic floods along the country's east coast. Protesters then marched to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Australia, long under fire as one of the world's top producers of coal and gas, said it will target net zero emissions by 2050, a target criticised by activists. Climate change protesters who have caused blockades at Sydney's major port this week say tougher penalties and the deportation of two activists will not stop them from continuing their campaign. The New South Wales government 
announced that it would ramp up its response to protests by the climate group Locking Australia, including the creation of a strike force aimed at disrupting activists, increased penalties, and possible jail time. Back to you, Anandi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia. Ethiopia's government said it hopes the humanitarian situation in Tigray will sustainably improve after declaring an immediate troops with rebellious forces. Ethiopia's government declared an immediate truce with rebellious Tigrayan forces on Thursday to allow aid into the war-ravaged northern province. A spokesman for the Tigrayan forces did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The 16-month-old conflict has pitted Tigray's rulers, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, against the central government led by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. More than 90% of people in Tigray need food aid, according to the United Nations. But only a tiny trickle has entered since Ethiopian troops withdrew from the region at the end of June last year. Both sides have previously blamed each other for blocking aid. In a statement, the government said it hopes the truce will substantially improve the humanitarian situation on the ground and would pave the way for the resolution of the conflict without further bloodshed. Thursday's announcement follows a visit by the US Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, David Satterfield, to the capital, Addis Ababa, this week. Experts from the American Bar Association dismissed Republican claims that U.S. Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown-Jackson was soft on crime at her confirmation hearing, and the Senate Judiciary Committee's Democratic chairman decried the attacks. Some of the attacks on this judge were unfair, unrelenting, and beneath the dignity of the United States Senate. The Senate Judiciary Committee's Democratic chairman on Thursday decried Republican attacks on U.S. Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown-Jackson during her confirmation hearing, accusing rival senators of trying to paint the candidate as soft on crime. I was so saddened by that, and it happened over and over and over again. The committee held its fourth and final day of confirmation hearings for Jackson, whom President Joe Biden has nominated to become the first black woman to serve in the nation's top judicial body. For two days, Jackson faced repeated attacks by several Republicans who accused her of being lenient in her previous role as a federal trial court judge in sentencing child pornography offenders. Why did you sentence someone who had child pornography of toddlers being sexually abused to 28 months, 64 percent below what the prosecutors asked for? The most hostile questioning came from Republican Senators Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton and Marsha Blackburn. You've picked out... Um... I don't know, seven, eight cases. I've sentenced more than 100 people. Jackson denied the allegations repeatedly. The committee on Thursday heard from outside witnesses offering their views on Jackson's record and qualifications. Over the last several days here in this committee, we have had a handful of senators argue that Judge Jackson is out of the mainstream when it comes to sentencing. Among them was Ann Williams of the American Bar Association, which has ranked Jackson, quote, well qualified for the role. Williams said that in interviews with 250 lawyers and judges who had first-hand knowledge of Jackson's career, none of them brought up issues involving her sentencing of child pornography defendants. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Uber said it will list New York City's iconic yellow cabs on its app, a move that marks the company's latest expansion into the taxi market and could help the ride-hailing giant overcome a driver shortage in its biggest U.S. market. Ukrainian ballerinas forced to flee war in their home country have found a temporary home at the German capital's main ballet company, which helps them with practice space, accommodation, clothing and career advice. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met his Indian counterpart in New Delhi after he arrived in the capital on the first visit by a top Chinese official since border clashes in 2020. Boris Romanchenko, a 96-year-old Holocaust survivor who was killed when shelling hit his flat in the war-ravaged Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, was buried. Renault, the Western car maker most exposed to the Russian market, said it would suspend operation at its plant in Moscow while it assesses options on its majority stake Avtovas, the country's number one car maker.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at thousands of red crabs heading for the sea, invading towns in Cuba as the numbers increase dramatically during the past two years due to the reduced traffic during pandemic lockdowns. Thank you for watching. Good night.